Before we begin, I'd just like to give a shout out to the sponsor of this editorial. When researching editions of Gauge the Issue, I'm always open to new resources, and one of the places I've come across recently is Readly. Readly is an online magazine app that gives you access to over 5,000 newspaper and magazine titles covering a wide range of specialist subjects, including motorsport, fishing, hunting, gaming, and of course, trains and railways. If you're like me and you don't particularly fancy reading a whole magazine but are mildly curious about a single article or you just simply want to browse, then you can just search for your chosen topic. Interested in railways? They've got you covered with mainstream press titles like Steam Railway, Heritage Railway, Rail, Railway Express and so much more, with access not only to the latest issues but previous ones stretching back several years. What helps is, once you've paid for the £9.99 monthly subscription, you can download any magazine you like, which means you don't need internet access to read them. So if you're travelling or you're on the go, you can have your entertainment sorted ready for the trip. And who knows, you may find yourself reading ones that you wouldn't otherwise have thought about. Put off by the idea of paying for new things? Well, it turns out the first two months are free. So if you like what you hear, feel free to give Readly a go and see what you think. And now, on with the show. Warning. Some, but not all, examples discussed in this editorial may not necessarily be centred around steam locomotives. Are you serious? I know, I know, but hey, what fun is a journey that can't take a different turn once in a while? There's a growing level of animosity within railway circles over historical documentation that's widely disputed due to recent discovery of new information or ongoing resurface and dismissal of the same information that threatens to alter the ideals of history that some people have become accustomed to. LNER wartime chief mechanical engineer Edward Thompson is a classic case in point, forever believed by railway historians of old to be spiteful, anti-Gresley, impossible to work with, and only really making one good loco design. But according to recent findings of Simon Martin and Tim Hillier Graves, some of his undoings appeared to be the stuff of popular myth. According to meeting minutes, locomotive reports and correspondence between Thompson and his contemporaries, his locomotives were some of the most readily available of the period. His supposed hatred of all things Gresley stemmed more from wartime requirements due to less manpower and materials over higher demand, and for years beforehand, Gresley and Thompson appeared to be on good terms. Few people realise that by the time Gresley died in 1941, Thompson had already rebuilt and, dare I say it, extended the life of a number of existing LNER and pre-grouping designs already, such as the old Great Eastern Railway Claude Hamiltons, which were rebuilt when Thompson was managing Stratford Works. Even the Preserve B12, number 8572, built in 1928, was rebuilt in 1933 with a round top boiler and long lap travel valves, similar to those that Thompson incorporated into the B1s. The main controversy with Thompson, though, is the fact that, while he was CME, a lot of Gresley's more unique locomotives were rebuilt into more conventional, if heavily controversial, machines. Namely, the 6P2282s and Gresley's first Pacific, number 1470 Great Northern. Generations would have you believe that Thompson personally and needlessly had these engines changed altogether to stick it to Gresley and his overcomplicated practices. But according to more recent findings taken from primary records of the day, Great Northern was in need of a rebuild at that time, and it was Thompson's locomotive superintendent, G.A. Musgrave, who chose the loco for this controversial new rebuild. The LNER's board of directors were desperate to reduce loco downtime in the midst of losing 60,000 members of their workforce and around 90% of their workshop resources for the war effort. While he tried to push for more original designs, Thompson could only get sanctioned to build 10 brand new locos in wartime and was ordered to rebuild many others due to the lower cost. He just so happened to be in favour of a more conventional manner. Out with the conjugated valve gear, in with three sets of wall shards. The results suffered a mixed reputation in terms of appearance and some say performance. Archive clips involving Thompson engines usually show them slipping when starting off implying perhaps unfair visual observations. Note the odd positioning of the cylinders. It's not surprising these engines slipped as much as they did. This wasn't helped when Thompson's other original design, the ill-fated L1 class 264 tank, is also reviled in history. The truth being that the prototype, built in 1945, did well during testing. But due to wartime requirements, the full batch of 100 engines, reduced from 110 under the LNER's modernisation plan, wasn't completed until 1950. 
Unfortunately, due to regime changes, the production L1 suffered rough riding due to terribly made axle boxes. The welded water tanks tended to leak, and the cabs proved drafty. Probably the only flaw that Thompson could be held to some account for was the position of the filler caps on the prototype engine's water tanks, which disabled refilling if the engine arrived at certain stations bunker first. Years down the line, just about every major railway historian and die-hard Gresley fan has effectively blacklisted anybody who so much as even dares to buck the trend of hating Thompson, thinking that all the flaws were design ones rather than production ones, principally because Great Northern was historically significant in their eyes and therefore sacrilegious to rebuild her into something that was meant more to fit demanding needs of a more difficult time rather than just do what Gresley did 20 years before. Yet, if it weren't for more recent findings, a fuller story of the subject wouldn't have been revealed, especially since 166 Gresley V2s and O2s continued being built by Thompson to more or less the same design. Here's the thing, revisionist history isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is inconvenient. If you spent years meticulously studying a specialist subject, sometimes even spending a fortune on said studying, only to be informed by some conveniently revealed discovery from another source that everything your study is based on was a lie, then instinctively, the mind would want you to deny it and believe that said revelation is the true lie. When Tiresley Locomotive Works were restoring number 4965 Rude Ashton Hall to working order, they spent nearly the whole restoration thinking she was number 4983 Albert Hall, but during restoration, components that were rarely, if ever, taken off the locomotive during its working life were found to be stamped 4965, and bits that were taken off had number 83 stamped over the top of 65. The engine returned to work in her true identity in early 1998, but apart from a few individuals calling for her to run as number 4983 in the same way that the King's Dragoon Guardsman ran as Royal Scott and vice versa, she's been known by her revealed identity ever since. So on the one hand, it can be quite harmless in some cases to get such things right for the sake of historical accuracy. But on the other hand, it's all too easy for someone to pass off an idealised lie as the truth, provided their case is presented convolutedly enough, which, as I'm sure we can all appreciate, can lead to problems over what gets passed off as fact, not least because genuine truth can get lost amongst the cleverly interpreted platitudes, especially now the internet pretty much allows everybody to post anything, anywhere, anytime. Going off topic here, perhaps the most infamous example of ongoing revisionist history from more recent times is the Titanic disaster. During the inquiry soon after the sinking, the surviving crew all testified that the ship went down in one piece, so popular media demonstrated that for more than 70 years. It was only when the wreck of the Titanic was discovered in 1985 and found to be split in two that new information and previously dismissed survivors' testimonies about the ship's sinking became more accepted by the general public, debunking part of the inquiry's conclusion. Further to that, long-term belief about the steel used in the ship being too weak was also debunked during destructive testing of material salvaged from the wreck in the mid-90s, proving that it took a force of over a tonne to break about three square inches of material. More recently than that, the wrought iron rivets holding the steel plates together were found to be made of a weaker grade of wrought iron than normal, meaning the rivets would fail more easily under pressure. To this day, new information about the Titanic is still being discovered, confirmed, debunked and debated. Speaking of the Titanic, you may recall the story in the railway press in mid-2021 about some London and South Western Railway boat train coaches discovered in South Wales, believed to have carried passengers to Southampton docks before the Titanic set sail. But anybody who moved and covered those coaches a few years earlier, including railway and Titanic historians, would tell you that the chances of them travelling to Southampton that morning are simply too difficult to confirm and given the amount of fake Titanic wreck memorabilia that gets passed around, it's more likely that the coaches in question were just examples of the type that would have either carried people down to Southampton for the occasion, or more likely were in service elsewhere on the network when she set sail. In some cases, revisionist history is important to help us understand the bigger picture. When most rail fans express what they think of engineers, they tend to judge them by the outcome of their work. For instance, Brunel is often judged as the greatest engineer of all time because of his railways, his ships and his bridges. But when looking into his shortcomings, like he didn't spend much time with his wife and kids, his attitude towards his workers wasn't very ethical, his attempts at locomotives were a laughing stock, his atmospheric railway was useless and his permanent way was too brittle when it needed a degree of flexibility, it kind of paints a different picture of him. 
There's a piece that Brunel wrote in the Civil Engineer and Architects Journal from July 1841 where he writes, It is impossible that a man that indulges in reading should make a good engine driver. And this has been open to interpretation on his character ever since. Some say he was prejudiced towards people who demonstrated a good academic education but worked at practical roles for a living, while others get the impression that he knew the human condition more than someone who was essentially a bookworm in a world full of navvies. But this does guide us into the points of interpretation. One of the most interesting quotes about interpretation I've come across is from the 1979 primetime debate on BBC Two concerning Monty Python's Life of Brian. When Malcolm Muggeridge and the Bishop of Southwark failed to understand the meaning of the film, John Cleese had this to say. It's also about closed systems of thought, whether they're political or theological or religious, whatever. Systems by which whatever evidence is given to the person, he merely adapts it, fits it into his ideology. I mean, once you've got, actually got, um, an idea that is whirring around so fast, that no other light or contrary evidence can come in, then I think it's very dangerous. In many ways, this quote has become more relevant about how things have panned out more than 40 years later. People can and will interpret ideas, stories and events in different ways, whether they should or not. Unfortunately, there are some people who disguise their falsified ideology as fact who are in a high enough position of influence that no truth or revelation can challenge them without the source of that challenge being publicly humiliated and dismissed because the high influence has simply become too intimidating and powerful. Half these people can't stand Skip, but no one wants to be the first to challenge him and risk alienation, so we follow the herd and end up leading lives of quiet desperation. When figures like that exist, it can lead to whole generations believing that white is black, that Life of Brian really was mocking Jesus instead of his extremist followers, that Brunel was a god, that Edward Thompson personally took a hammer to Great Northern, and the London and South Western are to blame for the Titanic's death toll because their coaches took passengers to their death. What it comes down to then is how people can separate the metaphorical wheat from the chaff. Which source material should people believe? How far can people go to find it? Do we just listen to the people who grew up at that time? Or should people learn to see through some of the bias and twists that were made up by some of the people who grew up at that time? A historian's worst enemy can be their bias, and once in a while, it becomes all too easy for their bias to become the new norm. If the creator of a puzzle passes away taking some of the pieces with them, it can be difficult for the casual onlooker to put some myths to the test by trying to make their own pieces to fill the gaps. Like with any specialist subject, revisionist history in railway circles can and will come up time and again down the years, and it will ruffle feathers. Some of it will be conspiracy theories misinterpreted from existing information, some of it will be cleverly disguised opinions deliberately twisted out of context to form propaganda campaigns to suit the minds of tunnel visionists wanting things their own way. But some of it really will be genuine, and the subsequent influence it has can prove invaluable for better or worse. The best thing we can all do as individuals is something else that John Cleese said about Life of Brian. Take a critical view. Find out about it. Don't just believe because somebody tells you to. Somebody in the pulpit says something. Question it. Work it out yourself. You're as human beings with emotional intelligence, what we're taught and what we learn aren't always one and the same. But that being said, it's important to be careful believing what we just want to believe because the long-term implications can become more damaging. I'm sorry if there's any truth that might put any noses out of joint because some pills really are hard to swallow. But if it's any consolation, Casey Jones really was the only one who died in his final collision. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue. I lost my mind in lockdown Time and time again I lost my mind